will actually help you get your foundations in order and then you can actually understand everything that you do in the future in AI and ML. So, so first of all, what we're going to do is uh, we'll go through this presentation. The first half will be taken by Kushali and then the second half will be taken by me. And then in the third half, we'll be doing a Python project, which will be taken by Nandan from the core team. So yeah, let's get started. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so we start, am I audible? Huh. Yes. Right, okay, great. So hi everyone, um, welcome to this workshop. My name is Kushali and let's just get right into it. So before we delve into what neural networks are, uh, we first need to understand what the basics are. So let's get that down first. So all of these terms you would have heard before, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. And a lot of these terms today are used interchangeably, but that's actually a misconception because uh, AI, ML, and DL are actually very different things in real life. So starting with artificial intelligence. So what is artificial intelligence? Very broadly, it is intelligence demonstrated by machines. And any simple program that you write or algorithm that you write is also a part of AI. So considering this example, we have a maze here and you can write a rigid C program to navigate this maze or you can use machine learning to smartly learn to navigate this maze. Both of them are actually a part of AI, artificial intelligence. So what's ML then? ML is machine learning and it is a subset of AI. So in this case, the machine learns automatically and improves and can make decisions based on its experiences. So initially it doesn't know anything and then it starts understanding how things work without us having to code it explicitly. So again, with the same maze example, um, this uh, using machine learning, we can make it learn and it can make decisions on itself and learn to navigate the maze. Machine learning has a ton of different algorithms. And one of these algorithms that we are going to study today is neural network. Now neural networks are really powerful and they form sort of like a cornerstone of machine learning and deep learning. So that brings us to deep learning. Now deep learning again is a subset of machine learning. So in this case, the machine still learns automatically through experience, but the difference is that it uses a deep neural network. Now these deep neural networks are actually of many different types. You have recurrent neural networks, you have uh, recursive neural networks. There are so many that we'll be learning today. So today we'll be focusing on just the basic artificial neural network, and we're going to see how it works and how it sort of learns on its own. So before we, uh, we proceed, uh, this is just to recap that artificial intelligence is again a very broad term whose subset uh, include machine learning and deep learning. So I hope everything till now is you know clear and that you've understood the differences between all of these. So I think we can now move on to what a neural network is. When what you see here is the general structure of a neural network. So some of you might be knowing this, but a neural network was actually inspired by the working of neurons in biological uh, in, in our bodies. So in our biology in biological neural networks, these neurons actually communicate with each other. They transmit signals to each other. And this is called as firing or activation of the neuron. So this concept was also applied to artificial neural networks where here we have. Extremely sorry for that. I will just continue. 
Yes, so as I was saying, um, these were inspired by the neurons in biology. So even in artificial neural networks, we have these nodes here called neuron. They're also again known as nodes. And similarly, they also get fired or they also get activated. Now these neurons are actually connected to each other. And these arrows here represent their connections. So they can connect. Yeah, they're connected this way, and this is how they can transmit signals from one neuron to another. So here we have an input layer, which is which can be made of one or more neurons. This input layer is then connected with many different layers, and this is where uh, deep learning comes from. So when we say there are a lot of layers, there can be hundreds or so layers, and these basically form uh, what these basically form the building blocks of deep learning. So after all these layers, we get the last layer, which is our output layer, where our prediction will be made based on the firing or the activation of these neurons. So this is how it looks. And now uh, we can study its components in detail. So first of all, we have a new neuron. OK, so a neuron has two parts. The first part is a summation function or a pre-activation function. And the second part is the activation function. So the summation function takes the values from the previous neurons and it adds it all up. And then the activation function acts on those values and it gives an output. Now this output is then sent to the next layer of neurons and so on and so forth. But just having inputs isn't enough. We also need to have something called weights and biases along with these inputs. So as we all know, neurons output numbers and they all need to be transferred to every neuron in the next layer. But how exactly is this happening? Yes, so this is where the concept of weights come in. So these values uh, associated with each neuron are actually multiplied by another number and this number is called as a weight. So suppose we have three neurons uh, suppose we have X1, X2 and X3. These neurons will be associated with a weight, which is W1, W2 and W3. And uh, we have to uh, multiply these together. So uh, we multiply that, uh, them with W1, W2 and W3. And basically why we're doing that is because weights will determine whether the neuron will get activated or not based on its value. So if there is some value, uh, then for that value it might get activated and if for some other value it might not get activated. So uh, as the neural network keeps learning, these weights also keep changing, which basically because these weights change, the neural network will then, you know, learn. Yes, so again this now that we have multiplied the weights together, it will go to the summation function and we can sum them. So now we get X1 into W1 plus X2 into W2 plus X3 into W3. So that's what we get uh, in the summation function. Yes, now this summation is a bit incomplete because it completely depends on the values of the neurons. So we have to introduce a value that doesn't depend on these neurons. And that value is basically the bias value. So here in our previous equation, it was X1 W1 plus X2 W2 plus X3 W3. We have added a constant value, which is W0. And sometimes it was also written as B, which is the bias term. Now the bias term is needed to, it's, it's similar to uh, using a constant in a linear equation. So you have a linear equation, you have a constant term in that. So bias acts here in the same way. So once the bias is added to this equation, this whole summation is now fed to the activation function of the neuron. So after that, what happens? So here in this, we're going to see about activation functions. Yeah, so just the summation itself is incomplete, OK? Because on, if we were only going to take the summation function, what we would be doing was we would just be performing addition and multiplication. We need to make sense of these values, right? So we need to have some sort of transformation of these values 
for it for us to get some sort of output. And for that we use an activation function. Now these activation functions usually involve some type of mathematical calculations uh, to sort of you know transform the values. So in the input layer, since they're just inputs, we do not use any activation. We keep them as it is. But in the rest of the layers, in the, act, in the hidden layers as well as in the output layers, we do use an activation function. The result that we get after passing it through that activation function is what the value of that neuron we, which we will get. And this will again be passed on to the next layer and then the other layer again. And that's how the chain will continue. So um, as you can see in this diagram as well, uh, we have the weighted inputs, which are uh, inputs multiplied by the weights. Then we sum it along with the bias term, and then it goes through the uh, activation function, which is F. And this is usually some sort of mathematical calculation or mathematical function, which we're going to look at in, in a while. Yeah, so you can see this video here and uh, it will make this concept way more clear. So as I mentioned, this is um, basically the weighted inputs which are getting summed and then it will get activated and then it will give us an output. Um, I, I hope this is clear and I hope we can move on now. Yes. So as I was saying, activation functions are of many different types because essentially they're just mathematical functions. So some of the most commonly used ones uh, we're going to discuss right now. And the first one, also the most commonly used one, is the ReLU activation. Now ReLU stands for Rectified Linear Unit. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's shown in the graph here. So what this does is it takes the maximum of zero and whatever input we have. So if we are entering negative input values, the result will be zero. That means that the neuron will not get activated. And if it's some other value, it will take the maximum that, of that value. So it will just be that value. So that's why because, that, because these values, the negative values are becoming zero, that's its main advantage. And uh, this is used in all the this is used in hidden layers mostly. And again, it's it requires less computation because only a certain number of neurons get activated. Not all of them need to get activated. So this is again very commonly used. Yeah, so next we have the sigmoid activation function. Now what this does is it's a le non linear activation function and the output always stays between 0 and 1. And this is that's why it's used in something. Uh, it's used in you know binary classification. When you want a value between 0 and 1 or it's used when we have to predict the probability of something. OK, and this is softmax is again usually used in the output layer for binary classification. And again, this is more computationally expensive than uh, the previous one, ReLU, because th for this, each and every value of the neuron will have to be converted to a value between 0 and 1. So all the neurons are getting uh, activated here. Uh, someone's hands, hand is up. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt, but I just had one doubt that is ReLU something different than the heavyside stamp function over there? Is there any difference or they both are just the same? Step function is different. I think uh, step heavy, side, heavy side step function over there. Uh, the similar condition is the where uh, function of it is uh, where the V is uh, the activation function is greater than the threshold value greater than and equal to then it is uh, the value stands at one over there. No, the value here doesn't get one. Because again, here for ReLU, it's basically you're taking the maximum of zero and the input. So here, even if it's greater than zero, the value doesn't become one. It stays as it is. So if I'm if my value is 2.6, then it'll be the output I'm getting will be 2.6. In heavy side step function, uh, I think uh, it's different. Like you'll get one, or you'll get some threshold value. 
Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It is compared that the activation function should be uh, should be greater than or equal to the threshold value. So then it will be considered as one. Otherwise, it is taken as zero. So it. I thought that it is quite similar to ReLU. So wanted to know the difference. Yeah. No. So ReLU is different from that because in ReLU, uh, it will just be yeah. So below zero, the negative values will be zero only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is cleared. Uh, I was just had doubt regarding this positive values. Yeah, uh, I hope it's clear now. Yeah, 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 it is clear. Thank you so much. OK, sure. Great. Yeah, so I guess we were here in soft, uh, softmax activation. OK, so in softmax, uh, softmax activation, this is very similar to sigmoid as well, where we can use it to predict the probability of our value being in a certain class or not. But over there, it was sigmoid was just used for binary classification, whereas softmax can be used for uh, you know predicting the class of it for multi-class. Uh, yeah, when we want to do a multi-class problem. So here, what basically happens is uh, it just normalizes the value and it divides it by its sum. So we'll be getting probabilities for each of the input values that we have. These probabilities will then decide whether again what these probabilities are again. We usually use it for the output layer, so it will just be a prediction in which class is it going to go to according to its probabilities. And here, yeah, you can see that the sum of all the probabilities will be one. So this was softmax. Yeah, next we have linear activation, which is again, it's very simple. It's in the form of y is equal to Cx constant multiplied by X, you'll just get a straight line passing through an origin. So what this does is it takes the input, the weighted sum, and it creates an output signal that is proportional to the input, which I just explained. It was in that form of that mathematical formula. But in this, a neural network with a linear activation function is just simply a linear regression model, meaning that what we're doing here is just we are uh, using a linear function here. So even if there are many layers in our neural network, it is the equivalent of having only one layer. If we use this linear activation for each layer, because again, uh, if there is a summation of everything linear, whatever we get in the output will be linear as well. That's why it has very limited power and ability to handle complexity, which is why we don't really use this in neural networks. Um, so yes. I think these were the types of uh, activation functions. So this machine learning part, uh, I think Kevin will take over from now. Yes. Um, so can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So now you guys know how neural networks work, at least how they make predictions. So you guys know how, what neurons are, you guys know how weights and biases work, and you guys also know how uh, activation functions work. So now you guys know the whole process of a neuron or a neural network. But in the neural network, there are so many weights to decide from. There are so many, all, all of these arrows stand for one weight. And by the way, neural networks have millions of weights. And GPT-3, which is one of the biggest neural networks that we know of, which is made by uh, Elon Musk company, uh, that has like trillions of parameters or weights. So how does the neural network actually decide the value of so many weights? So this is where machine learning comes in. Uh, first of all, we start with random values for the weights just to see what is happening. So we start with, you know, any value for the weights. Let's say two, three, whatever. You can even uh, set it individually for each one if you want, but the computer does it anyway. So it starts with random values and then it makes a prediction. So this prediction can be, uh, you know, it, it could be anything. It could be a pre very bad prediction prediction because we are starting with random values. So then we compare the prediction the predicted output with what we want. So is the predicted output good enough or is it like really bad? How do you actually compare these? You use something called a loss function or an error function 
this error function will will compare the predicted output and the real output and it will give us the error that we want so uh that not the error that we want but the error that is there and then what we want is to ch is to change the weights so that we get a little less error next time and then we just keep repeating this process we predict we predict the output we compare the output with the real output and then we get the error use the error to change the weights and then with the new weights predict the output again and then change the weights again so it just continues on until like at least until you're satisfied with the output or until the model is just cannot learn more because every model has a limit uh, of learning so let's actually see this in process so for example so what is happening here is called the forward pass which is just using random values to make the prediction and so once you get the prediction, you apply the loss function. And once you get the loss, you use something called back propagation, which is just adjusting all the weights to reduce the loss. So first of all, these weights are adjusted, the ones that are nearest to the last layer. And then these weights are adjusted, and then these weights are adjusted. So you, you go backwards, that's why it's called back propagation. And then the whole process just repeats again. That's what we do the whole time, just, uh, forward propagation and then you get the error and then back propagation again so so loss functions uh this is how we calculate the error as i said loss functions there are many popular loss functions and here I, i'm just gonna show you the two most popular ones that you'll probably come across when you actually start machine learning and so the first one is the mean squared error function this you've probably seen in class 11th or 12th or whatever uh, it's pretty easy to understand and it is used for regression task regression is basically um it's like predicting real values so the difference between classification and regression is that in classification what you're doing is like you're predicting in classes so for example if i give you an image of an animal uh, and you want to predict whether it is an, a dog or a cat or a horse so those are only three classes so that's multi-class classification you're predicting between three classes so that's called classification. And so regression is like uh, if I give you the characteristics of a house and like the length, the number of square feet and everything, then you would predict the price of the house, let's say. So that would be a regression task. So that mean square error can be used there. And the cross entropy function is used for classification tasks. So let's let's check out both of these. So the mean square error, first of all, it is the easiest one to understand the so why i here is the let's say we're predicting the price of houses so and we have 10 houses the, in that case n here would be 10 and y i would be the price the real price of the first house so y1 would be the real price of the first house and then minus y1 p would be the predicted price of the first house so the model made the predictions for every single house and then that's what we put in the error function so y1 minus y1 predicted the whole square and then y2 minus y, y2 predicted whole square are to y10. So that's what we do. We we square them and then we add them together and then we take the mean. So that's why it's called mean squared error. And yeah, if if your if all your predictions are exactly perfect, which will most probably never happen, but if your all your predictions are perfect, then all of these terms will be zero. So your error will be zero. And so that would be a perfect model. Whenever the error is zero, your model is actually perfect but that's never gonna happen because there will always be an error. So cross entropy. Now, let's say you have predicted the probabilities using softmax or any other function. Uh, it could even be a sigmoid function if you're using binary classification. So binary classification is when you're using only uh, two classes, either a dog or a cat. But if you have a dog, cat, horse, cow, whatever, then you have to use the softmax function. So, and you have these predicted probabilities and you have the true value. So what you do here is forget about this formula that's in the middle. It's, it's, it looks disgusting, but it's pretty easy. Uh, first of all, we have on the left here, the predicted probabilities using the softmax function. And on the right side, we have the true probabilities that we want. Now, the true probabilities are always in ones and zeros because if the image is an image of a dog, then you, then you know that it is a dog. You don't have to like guess. So it's always you have 100% certainty that is a dog because it, it's the true value. So one zero zero. So this is dog. This is for cat and this is for horse. And this is all for one image, by the way. 
And for that image, the model predicted that there is 0 0.7 probability that it is a dog, 0 0.2 that it is a cat, and 0 0.1 that it is a horse. So what you do with the cross entropy function is you use one. So you put one here, L1 is one. And then you use S1, which is 0 0.7. So one log 0 0.7 and then plus zero, L2 is zero, log 0 0.2 and then plus zero log 0 0.1. And so the, these two terms are zero, so that so all you're left with is one log 0 0.7, which is just log 0 0.7. And log 0 0.7 is a negative value, so yeah, so we, that's why we apply the negative function so that you get a positive error. And if your prediction was 100% perfect, again, in this case, you would have one zero zero instead of 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So one zero zero and one zero zero. So these two terms would be zero. This would be one log zero and log zero. Uh, wait, no, one log one. So logs, log one is zero. So that's why you get zero error in the cross entropy. So that would be a perfect model. Now, if you have, if your prediction was 100% in imperfect, so that case, this would be zero. So instead of one here, you would have zero and then somewhere else, it doesn't really matter. Then you would have one into log of zero and log zero is infinity. So your cross entropy would be really high. In in computers, what we do is we don't put infinity because computers cannot calculate using infinity and neither can we. So usually cross entropy functions use clipping. So instead of zero, they would put 0 0.00000 or something so that you would get a very high error, but it would not be infinity. So yeah, that would be for a very imperfect model, the most imperfect model. So that was just for a single data point. That was for one image of a cat or a dog or a horse or whatever. But if you have many images, let's say you have 10 images or 10 million images, then you would have n is equal to that number. So 10. So that would be you would add the cross entropies of every single image and then you would take the average cross entropy. That's what you do for, let's say, 10 million examples. You take the average of 10 million. Uh, images. So that's those are your activation functions. Now, does anyone have any doubts here so far? That's no, why not activation functions, loss functions. Okay. Gradient descent. Now, you know the error. You know how to get the error, and you know you know. But how do you actually change the weights using that error? What do you actually do with the error? So that's where you use gradient descent. So first of all, um, the the way to change the weights is to go in the direction of decreasing loss. Now, what do I mean by decreasing loss? The loss doesn't actually have a direction, right? It's just a scalar quantity. So what I mean by that is you have to look at a graph. And here I've plotted the value of the loss with respect to just one single weight. So let's say the model only has one weight, then this would be the graph that we get. Now, there, there, there can be more complicated graphs, but I've, I've chosen the most simple one here. So you take this graph and you can see that if the weight is really low, then your loss would be really high. And if the weight is really high, then your loss would again be really high. But if your weight is in the middle, then you have found the sweet spot where, you know, that exact uh, quantity of weight would give you the lowest loss. So like I said, we initialize the weight to a random value. So let's say we're starting here with this value of the weight and this value of the loss. This value of the weight gives you this value of the loss, by the way. This is not uh, the weight gives the loss, not the loss gives the weight. So, so let's move down towards the bottom. We, that's what we want to do here. This is our starting point. We want to basically move down like a ball rolling down a hill. So this is our end point and this is where we want to get to that because that is the direction of decreasing loss. So this can be pretty easily represented visually, but how do we actually do this mathematically? So you calculate the gradients. Now the gradients, uh, you might have learned it in physics or I'm pretty sure they teach it in the first year and they also teach it in like 11th or 12th standard. I, I'm pretty sure they do. But in this case, the gradient is just a slope. It's pretty easy to understand. 
the only difference between a gradient and a slope is that the gradient is a vector. So uh, in if, if you're on the left side, the, the slope would be negative because you know that's how slopes work. This is an obtuse angle, so the slope would be negative. And if you're on the right side, the slope or the gradient would be positive. And then if you're right here, then you're drawing a tangent, of course, and the, if the line is horizontal, then the gradient is zero. And that's exactly where we want to get to. That's the sweet spot that I was talking about. So using the gradients, if we get a negative gradient, then we want to move towards the right because that's the direction of decreasing loss. And if you have a positive gradient, then we want to move towards the left. And then if we have a zero gradient, then we don't want to do anything because that is exactly where we want to get to. So again, if we have a negative gradient, we want to move towards the right, which means on the x-axis, move to the right. So moving towards the right means to actually increase the weight. And if you have a positive gradient, then we move towards the left, which means decreasing the weight. And if you have a zero gradient, then we don't want to do anything again because that is the sweet spot. Now, this is how you actually adjust the weights, by the way. This is exactly what we do with the error. So, as I said, with a negative gradient, we want to increase the weight. But here I've written a formula where W1 is equal to W1 minus eta into the gradient. Eta is a positive value, which we'll talk about later, but forget about that for now. Why have I actually like decreased? Why have I actually subtracted value from the weight? Because uh, we were supposed to increase the weight, but here I'm actually subtracting something from the weight. So why have I actually done that? Can anyone give a guess or something? So the reason I have subtracted from this weight to increase the weight is because the gradient is negative. And with a negative gradient, uh, if you had a negative value, a negative sign, it, that would be a positive. So we actually increased the, increasing the weight here, which is what we want. Now with the positive gradient, we want to decrease the weight. So the, here the gradient is positive. So uh, adding a minus sign would, would decrease the weight. And then with a zero gradient, we want to do nothing. Uh, here the gradient is zero. And so W1 is equal to W1 in the end. And so we get uh, the same formula for all three cases, which is which simplifies the things a lot. So now the bigger the gradient, uh, sorry, the bigger the slope or the gradient, the faster it's, it falls down the slope. So if you start here, uh, if you start here, your gradient would be really steep because the slope is so steep. And so you would make bigger jumps, bigger jumps and bigger jumps. And, and, and then your jumps will get smaller every time you go down the hill because the slope is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And, uh, and while you get to the, uh, and as you get to the end point, your jumps will be really, really small. Uh, and that actually is actually good because it adds a lot of precision to our model. Because if we were making such big jumps, then we would just jump over the end point, you know? So when we're near the end point, we want to be making small jumps. So here's a, a visual representation. I'm not sure if you guys can see this properly, but this thing is falling down. So initially the jumps are very small because as you can see here, the slope is like almost horizontal, but not really. So it is it is taking very small jumps, but as it gets to this middle point, the slope is very large. And so it is taking bigger jumps. And then at the end again, it slows down again. So if you have two weights, then you would have a three dimensional graph uh, on the right side, this graph, you can see the ball rolling down the hill. This is actually a three dimensional hill now, thankfully. So you got on the X axis, uh, weight, uh, weight one, let's say, and W2 is on the Y axis and the height of the graph is the loss. So it's, again, the ball is rolling down the three dimensional hill. And then usually the graphs, like I said, would be much more complex that, that these are very simple graphs and you'll probably never see these graphs. But uh, usually the graphs are even more complex than what you're seeing here. So for, an, for n weights, you would have an n plus one dimensional graph. Now, as human beings, we can only see in three dimensions. So uh, usually computers are very helpful in this stuff because we, if we have, you know, two million dimensions, you can't have, you can't see, you can, you can't even see a four dimensional graph. So let's say you have multiple minimas. 
uh, which is usually the case and which causes a, a big problem in gradient descent, which is the problem of local minimas. So if you start on either of these points, as you can see, the ball rolling down the hill would reach the global minimum. But if you start here or here or somewhere over here, then you would reach the local minimum, which is not where you want to be. Uh, and the model usually gets stuck there because it doesn't know that there is a lower point. It thinks that that is the lowest point uh, in the in the graph. So to tackle this problem, we have other types of gradient descent, like stochastic gradient descent and midi batch gradient descent. These terms you might not understand them right now, but honestly, uh, there are a lot of gradient descents. And if I was to explain all the different types, that would take like half an hour extra by itself. So. Uh, what I would recommend is to go through blogs or videos explaining all the different types of gradient descent so that you can actually understand what all of them do. And uh, I will tell you what, what the most popular one is. Uh, usually in machine learning models, we will use Adam. Uh, that, that is the name of the gradient descent is actually Adam. So A-D-A-M. And that is the most popular one usually that you'll see in today's models. Uh, it uses something called momentum, which is basically if you're falling in the same direction for a lot of turns, then you're obviously going in the right direction. So you, so you gain momentum as you fall. So that's a different type of gradient descent as well. So all of these types help in their own ways. And so you want to pick the right one for your model. Now the learning rate, eta. Now here, as I said, the learning rate eta, this is the eta and this is the Greek alphabet eta. So W1 is equal to W1 minus eta into the gradient. So if eta is really high, then the impact on W1 would be really high. And if eta was really slow, uh, really low, then the impact on W1 would be really low. So you want to pick obviously the right value for eta as well, because if you if your value for eta or the learning rate is too low, then your model will be making extremely small jumps and it would take absolutely like hours and hours or even whatever days to reach the minimum depending on your data in the model and if your eta is really high on the right side as you see here you would be making huge jumps now this is a bit a bit of an exaggeration but uh let's say you were your eta was too high but it's not that high then it would be making like really big jumps over here and it would just keep missing the minimum every single time that it makes the iteration so it will never converge at all this this one would converge and actually reach the minimum but this one would never do it because it's, it's impossible. It's too high. But what you actually want is neither of these. You want your eta to be just right. So what you want is a perfect learning rate that would make you reach the minimum as fast as possible, but also not make you miss the minimum because that's not what you want. So that was gradient descent. If anyone has any doubts up to this point, just let me know because now we'll move on to backpropagation. OK, so let's look at the back propagation. The back propagation is how how we change the weights. So you know how to how gradient descent works, but how how does every single weight in the model actually get changed? So that's why you use back propagation. Now let's take a super simple network. First of all, this network, I have to explain a few things in, the, in this diagram. I've taken this diagram from the deep learning and PTL course by uh, IIT Guwahati. It's a great course, but it, it's full of mathematics. So if you guys are really like interested in the mathematics part of deep learning, then you should definitely give it a try. So this is basically the L theta is the loss function. Y cap is the output function or the activation function of the last layer. And then each layer here only has one neuron. So uh, th that's why it's a super simple network. And AL1 is the pre-activation and H21 is the activation. So all the A's here are pre-activations. I don't know why they wrote it like that, but whatever. And all the H's are activation functions. Just so you know. And the W's are the weights of the model. So, so let's say we have w11 that we want to change we could change any of these but i'm just taking w11 because it's easy to understand so w11 in order to change w11 what we actually need is this term right here the gradient of the loss function with respect to w11 
So we're not taking any random gradient. We're actually taking the gradient of the loss function with respect to W11. So, and by the way, gradients are calculated using partial derivatives. And so, yeah. Now, this loss function is actually like it's not in terms of W11. When you lose the loss function, you're actually just comparing the predicted output with the real output. And that is why uh, Y cap and Y cap P, as, as you saw, suppose it was the mean squared error. So that would work. That's what it would be. There's no W term in the loss function. So we want to use a chain rule in order to get to the W term. So this huge formula that you see here is actually very simple. It's just using the chain rule. So let's take the loss function. Now the loss function is only dependent on Y cap. So we first uh, break it down into Y cap. So del of loss function with respect to Y cap. Now Y cap is a function of this pre-activation function. So that's what we're doing here. Del of Y cap with respect to the AL1. This one is not supposed to be there is an error. Uh, and then AL1 is a function of what? It's, it's a function of the previous summation layer, a uh, previous uh, activation layer. So that's what we're doing here. AL1 by H21. Now this H21 is a function of A21. So a del of a, H21 by del of A21. And then this continues until we get to A11. Now A11 is the summation function of the first layer. Now so there's no function before A11. So now we can get to W11, which is what we wanted. So because A11, as you as you saw in the summation function, what is summation function? W1x1 plus W2x2 plus W3x3, it continues till WNXN. So, so the summation function is always dependent on the weights. So uh, A11 is a function of W111. So del A11 by del W11. And all of these terms, by the way, if you can see, they, they get canceled and all you're left with is this what we want. Now, the computer can calculate all of these because the loss function is in terms of this. The output function is in terms of this. This is in terms of this. So now the computer ha can calculate all of these. So computer will calculate this and then multiply it with the calculation of this and then multiply it with the calculation of this and so on until it gets the whole term. And that's how one gradient is calculated. And then we can use this gradient to uh, change our, you can use this gradient to change our W11. So let's take a bigger model now. Now, this bigger model, in this case, the loss, the loss function is a cross entropy function. So the loss function, first you, you take the gradient of the loss function with respect to the output functions or the activation functions of the last layer. And then you take the gradients of those with respect to these pre-activation functions. And then you take the gradients of those with respect to this, this uh, activation function, these activation functions. And then you take the gradients of those with the ones below. And then you go lower and lower and lower until you reach the weights that you wanted. So in order to talk to the weight directly again, that's this is this is the just summing up of the back propagation. Uh, in order to talk to weight direct to the weight directly, you use you talk to the output layer first, then you talk to the previous hidden layer, then talk to the previous hidden layer, and then you talk to the weights. So once you get this value, you can just input it in the formula that we had before. W111 is equal to W111 minus eta into the gradient. So that is back propagation. That was the last topic in this presentation. Now, if anyone has any questions about back propagation or you didn't understand something, not just back propagation, but anything else, just let us know so that we can help you. Otherwise, we will continue with the project. Okay, so, uh, these are points of contacts. If you want to learn anything or if you want any guidance, then you can contact uh, any of us. Uh, these are the leads and these are core, core team members. So you can contact us through WhatsApp. We'll, we'll send a message in the group actually so that you know who we are. Yeah, so let's continue on with the project now. On to Nandan. Hello, everyone. So Kevin, my screen is visible. Huh. 
Okay. So now, as you have understood the theory, let's start with the practical implementation of ANN. So here we are using the Jupyter Notebook ID. It is like if you are from first year, you are you should be familiar with Turbo C. So it is basically a Turbo C for Python programming language. Okay, where can you run the code and see the output likewise? But the better uh, the good uh, point for Jupyter Notebook is you not need to run the code entire uh, all code every time. You can run the code line by line and see the output of the code. So now let's start coding our first workshop. During this workshop, we are going to predict the house price. It is a very popular data set uh, for Boston house price, house price prediction. So for that, first, first of all, we have to import some of the libraries. The first library is Pandas. It is a basically to work with CSV file. It will create a data frame and we can do the, some compu uh, computation on the data frame like it to read the Excel file or CSV file when the data is in tabular form we need uh, we can use the pandas the numpy is uh, uh, like uh, mathematical library for which we can uh, to do array manipulation and to create a array like likewise and the matplotlib this is basically a visualization visualization library for, with the help of matplotlib we can create uh, we can visualize the plot uh, we can create the plots and we can uh, see the accuracy of our model by plotting the and the TensorFlow is a deep learning library and for uh, to do to create basically our ANN we will use the Keras. So first of all we have to import the data to import the data we can use the pandas read C read underscore CSV function. Okay so first of all we have to re uh, run this first line. So to run this you can create uh, you can click on run or you can just simply uh, press shift, shift enter on your keyboard. So you can see that the it is already loaded in my computer so it runs so fast so now we have to import the data set to import our data set we will use the read csv function of pandas and in the function you have to give the parameter as the uh, path of your csv file so here you can see that my csv file is the, the same folder so i just have to mention the name of my file so let's run this file okay now we have to see the that the file is loaded or not to check that we can use the df dot head the head function will print the the top of the our, our csv file you can pass any number of rows here so if you don't pass anything it will by default it will print the first five rows of our data set of our data frame okay now let's see how many entries are there in our data frame for that we have to uh, we can use df dot shape so here you can say that uh, you can see that there are total 20,640 number of rows. There are total 20,000 uh, data points in our data set. And the 10, uh, 10 is the number of column, which is our features. Okay, so now before uh, applying a model to our you know, data set, we have to do some pre-processing step. One of these is like uh, finding the null values in our data set. To find the null value, we can use the is null function of pandas so you can see that in the longitude latitude and house and all other files there are no null values all other features only a total bedrooms has 207 null values so we have to remove that that null values or we have to do some imputation we can do uh, there are many ways to handle the null values one of the ways to simply delete all the rows which uh, all the data points which has null values here we can see that we have total 20,000 around data points and only 207 data point has null values. So we can delete them. But uh, here I have, I have used another strategy. Uh, here I have imported the SKLN library and from SKLN we have imputed the, uh, imported the simple imputer. What we are going to do, we are going to replace all the values with the median of that column. Like all the 207 null values from the total bedrooms will be replaced by the median of all other uh, available non null values of total bedroom so we let's run this now if we again check the null values you can see that there are no null values all null values are replaced by the median of that feature okay so many data set has categorical values like uh, the string uh, they have simply a string in their so we cannot uh, our model cannot compute the string values we have to convert it in a number some way so how to convert a string into a number 
we can use the one head one hot encoding for that first of all we have to check what are the various category available in our feature like here on here we the ocean proximity is only has uh, only column which has the categorical features like which has a string as values so if we run them you can see that there are various strings and the number of number of count like near ocean has 2658 that means that 2658 rows have near ocean value so we have to convert it in a integer so how to convert it there is a famous very famous method which is as called which is called as one hot encoding here what we are going to do we are going to create a new column with the name of the the strings like ocean inland near ocean near bay and iceland and which and if row has a value near bay then we will put one in near bay and all other we will make it as zeros we can do this with the help of pandas get dummies function it will do it will create a dummy columns for all the categorical features or the categorical variables okay so let's run that run this line so now if you see we have new columns and the older column which is called as ocean proximity ocean proximity has got deleted and we have new column like ocean uh, proximity inland ocean pro proximity iceland and all other if a column has one value then the if the column has uh, previously if column has uh, near bay then it will get a one and all other column will get a value zero you can see that the first row it is a near bay and here it got one and all other column got zero so okay now here the our target variable is medium median house value so we have to predict the house value using the features available it so we have to uh, we have to convert our data set into the target values like into the independent feature and dependent feature here so we want to predict the median house price so it is our dependent feature we our target variable so we'll call is that call it as y and all other features excluding the target median house value will be x so let's run it now we have to split our data set into train and test basically we have to train our model using the train data set and we will check how much it has learned using the test data set so test data data set is basically uh, unseen data set so we can know how much our model has learned from the train data set so we can to split the data we can use the sklearn model selection library and we can import the train train test split here we will passing the our independent feature our dependent feature and the test size which means the total number of 0.20% of total numbers of rows will be on the test size and rest of them are on the train size okay now here we have to do a feature scaling basically what this mean you can see that the total rooms has some values 880 7090 and the household has some other values so if suppose if uh, total room has values of 4 5 and the area which has larger values like uh, 1000 and 2000 so what our model will see it will uh, it will give more importance importance to the area because it will have higher impact on the price because of the rooms has smaller values like if room is 4 to 5 then the value will not change but if area changes uh, then value changes so model will think that the will think that the area has higher importance and it will give low importance to the total rooms for that we have to convert all the columns into one standard range which we can do that with the help of standard scalar here we are using the standard scalar and we are fitting our standard scalar onto the train data and we are transforming our data Use, uh, into the scale format where the mean is zero and the standard deviation of our standard deviation is one. So we can do that with the help of sklearn preprocessing library. Here, uh, with the help of numpy, we have to reshape our two D array, in, oh, sorry, our one dimensional array into a two dimensional array. So our a artificial neural network model can take the input and do the predictions it is simply a uh, array manipulation here in the first two line first two line we are converting our data to the numpy array 
so uh, that list into the numpy array and then we are uh, reshaping our array to two dimensional where the number of rows will be the number of entries in the white in the train target variable and the one is the number of columns so it will be a 2d array so because uh, with the help of that we can make make the predictions now if okay so there is error okay now if you see you can see that the number of train uh, number of rows in train has decreased from 20000 to 16000 so basically means that 20% of the our total data set got into the uh, test data set and rest of are on the train data set so now we have uh, we have to train our model we can use it uh, do it using the model dot uh, keras dot model dot sequential it is a sequential api using uh, keras with the help of that we can create a, a deep neural network here we, i have just uh, created a vanilla only of with the one hidden layer so how can you do that so you can create a model you can initialize the model with the keras dot models dot sequential here first of all the first layer will be the input layer which we can which can be defined using the input shape using the x train and it will take the first uh, first index of x train which is a num uh, which is a number of sorry second which is a number of features like first uh, first layer has to be the uh, the number of neuro neuron in the first layer has to be the num equal to the number of features we have in our data set so there are total 20 features in data set so we are taking the value 20 and we are giving to the input shape so now the second layer will have the 30 neurons and the activation function is relu and our final layer will have one neuron only the activation is linear here we are using linear activation because it is a regression model so we cannot use a sigmoid or a softmax as our output layer if we run this now we here we have compiled our model using the mean square error they here the loss function is mean square error as kevin explained you in the regression model we use mean square error as our loss function and here optimizer means the gradient descent we are using here we are using sophisticated gradient result, uh, gradient descent and the learning rate is 1 10 to the power minus 3 okay so now we have to fit our model using the trained data and here validation split means the 25 uh, 75% of our trained data will uh, our model will be get on will trained on the 75% of our trained data and the rest 25% data will be used to validate our model the number of epochs simply means the number of iteration we want to go forward and do the back propagation okay if we run this now you can see that it is training it is a it is training very fast because because it is a very simple vanilla network so we have to just wait for a 5 to 10 seconds and it will get fully trained So you can see that our loss and validation loss is decreasing by epoch after every epoch because it is learning very good because after every iteration it is learning and because of this our loss is decreasing. Now if you see our epoch all the epochs has been completed so let's plot our valid our loss like using the python library matplotlib. So here we are put uh, from the history, which is the model dot fit. Here we have initialized with model dot fit the history variable. From the history, get the loss and get the validation loss and plot it using the matplotlib dot pyplot. The title will be model loss, the y label and the x label. If you run this, you will see that after every epoch, or both our losses are decreasing. So it is a good thing so now if you want to make the prediction on the x states we can use model dot predict and if you run this 
and if you see the y pred we'll see that is making a prediction now but we have to check what is the test score what is the score of our model how much how good it has learned so if you print the y test and if we just to calculate the r square which is the method to evaluate a model it is basically a 1 minus the 1 minus the mean square error divided by the variance of prediction so if we run this you can see that the r square is 0 0.70 so it is uh, very good uh, like if r square is 0 it means our model is very bad like it is all the predictions are wrong and if the r square is near to 1 it means that our model is very good to the actual prediction so 70 means it is a very good model so we can optimize our model using the more number of layers like you can here you can add more number of dense layers or you can use this number of uh, you can change the learning rate learning rate or you can change the split or you can increase the number of epochs or you can increase or decrease the batch size so i hope you understand how to create a simple vanilla network in the, using the python keras you can also do it with the, using the pytorch library okay so now kevin will take over from here okay so if so that was the end of the workshop if you guys have any questions or feedback to share or whatever you guys want to say if you guys have anything to say just let us know or any questions to ask Okay, then I guess we can just end this workshop right now. Uh, in after this workshop, I will send some resources in the WhatsApp group and the Discord as well, so that and obviously just invite your friends to the WhatsApp group if you want. But I, I will send some resources on learning graded descent and you know some projects, project ideas and stuff like that. Like how how can you proceed from here? Okay, so thank you for coming to this workshop. <laughs>